It is my great honor and joy to introduce uh, a rising star uh, uh, of a young scientist uh, from a medical school uh, in uh, northern part of uh, Sri Lanka. This is uh, Professor Anjana Silva. Anjana, very good uh, morning to you and uh, the welcome to the World Federation Neurology YouTube channel and social media team. Uh, tell us uh, about uh, you. Uh who you are and what you do these days uh, and how are you coping with this pandemic uh, with regard to virtual teaching and rest of the other things? I guess it's a very good afternoon for you, Professor uh, Tissa. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to have this uh, chat with you. And uh, yes, uh, I'm quite excited uh, about, you know, I, I, I saw these social media posts and uh, um, you know, um, uh, the information available in uh, the internet regarding the World Brain Day uh, programs. And uh, I, I'm quite uh, interested on uh, uh, the brain issues as well. You know, not only just, you know, the neuromuscular physiology, but the whole neurology. So I'm quite excited uh, about this whole uh, event. The, the actually, it is uh, somewhat fittingly, Anjana, the, the, you probably would know that uh, one of the Australian uh, who won Nobel Prize uh, is uh, Professor Eccles, uh, or late Professor Eccles, uh, the Eccles Center in Australian National University. And uh, I was uh, talking to one of the retires, uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, currently in USA, about uh, sort of a, the origin of uh, demyelination, if you like, and then he was chatting to me quite excitedly. Uh, his work was primarily neurophysiology under Eccles lab. Uh, Eccles was, was uh, primarily uh, the pioneer of, uh, on, in sort of synapses and, and many things, as you know, uh, the, the claiming Nobel Prize uh, along the way later on. Uh, and this particular gentleman, you would see his video later on when it is edited. Uh, and uh, uh, while he was working on neurophysiology, he supported Ian MacDonald or late uh, Professor Ian MacDonald uh, who was also in New Zealand at that time in a small lab. Uh, they were the first uh, group uh, to use uh, diphtheria toxin uh, to inject uh, animal models uh, and uh, the demonstrate uh, demyelination uh, in neurological disorders for the first time in the world, uh, which basically prompted uh, him to be the chair of neurology at Queen Square. Uh, London, which, is, which was regarded as a mecca of uh, brain health or brain science at that time. It's a small world in that context. So you are uh, in a way connected to brain uh, despite your main work uh, is in neurophysiology and uh, snake toxin. So tell us about uh, how the, your journey come about. Uh, you graduated from medical school. What inspired you to get into basic science of uh, neuronal activity? Who inspired you and uh, how did uh, this occur? Uh, yes, I guess uh, it's a bit of a atypical uh, journey, I guess. Uh, so um, since my school days, I was quite interested about um, the wilderness. So uh, before the A-levels, I really wanted to study about wilderness and uh, especially um, seriously uh, study um, the reptiles and freshwater fish and amphibians. Um, so I started learning taxonomy. Um, so I wanted to really, um, you know, uh, uh, not only to go to the wilderness and then like um, catch animals and to see their you know, subtle differences between the species and so on. But then I really wanted to uh, dig deeper into that and then uh, um, to um, uh, you know, appreciate certain uh, differences that occur within populations of um, animals. So uh, this, uh, this uh, curiosity actually inspired me to um, even um, continue my uh, this, uh, wilderness activities while I was in my Peradini Medical School. So at that time, um, with one of my friends, um, Kalana Madhuge, who is currently a professor in uh, Peradini Medical Faculty. So we got um, together, uh, did certain studies on um, snakes, uh, like hump nose vipers, uh, especially looking at their taxonomy. And then- This, uh, this is not knowing where you two would end up. I'm sure you didn't think that you would end up as uh, two young professors at that time. No, no, not actually. So right. we were quite uh, curious about like uh, how these animals uh, speciate. Uh, 
and uh, why this much of speciation occurring in Sri Lanka? Is there any evolutionary reasons and so on? So uh, nothing related to medicine. But uh, then um, when we were doing 30 appointments uh, in Martali Hospital, uh, when we were doing medicine appointments, we realized that there are lots of humpness white patients coming to uh, Martali Hospital and uh, we were not able to really identify which species the patients were bitten by. So then we started- Anjana, with... is it uh, correct to tell our viewers that uh, this would be uh, like a very basic hospital from Western standards? Uh, uh, you could is it is it uh, reasonable for me to tell that it is a sort of a semi rural type hospital or would yes, uh, I offend someone say, by saying that yes uh, so this this was about like uh, 20 years back so uh, this was uh, at that time also Martale was a base hospital so they had one consultant um, uh, uh, per one specialty um, for four major specialties Mm -hmm. So medicine, there was one consultant. So um, we saw how many humpness white bite patients appear in the wards, but actually we were not able to really identify uh, uh, the sp uh, sp uh, snakes to the species level. So then uh, we started this project in, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, making our, the, or the sorting out the um, taxonomy of humpness wipers. Uh, so, then uh, after um, the um, completion of our MBBS, then uh, we, uh, until we, uh, we start our internship, we had about one year uh, time period. So mm -hmm. during that time, uh, we were working uh, full-time as field biologists of, uh, um, of the Agra Boretum, uh, located uh, close to Horton Plains in uh, Central Highlands. Mm -hmm. uh, Who supported you to financially at that time? Yes, so that was uh, the whole setup was um, uh, initiated by um, Mr. Rohan Petivoda, mm -hmm. who's um, one of the uh, most um, um, influential and leading scientists Sri Lanka we ever produced. So, so uh, he has got nothing to do with medical school or academic career or nothing of that sort. No, no, he's uh, he's again he's a um, entrepreneur and he's a, uh, as as well as he's a world famous ichthyologist person mm -hmm. who studies. Uh, freshwater fish. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, um, he wanted to like build this uh, research center where, where young people are um, facilitated to um, continue their um, um, uh, research studies on wilderness. So during this one year period- Hang on, hang on a second, Anjana. So this is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so this is very extraordinary path to your contemporary medical graduates, I would assume. Most yes. of your friends would have uh, gone to help out uh, either in uh, semi sort of a private clinics uh, or join uh, one of the university departments as temporary demonstrator for a fixed salary. But yes. you, two, you two took a completely different turn, probably yes. for the first time uh, as uh, best as I could uh, imagine to do a different path uh, to spend this year. Am I correct? Yes, exactly. So it was uh, quite atypical because the, the, the center itself was located quite far from uh, um, a major city. It's very close to Horton Plains, very mm -hmm. isolated, uh, a 50 acre land where the research center was established and we were basically on our own. Um, we, should, we should tell our viewers uh, when uh, the travel is uh, allowed later on, when we eventually come out of uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, Horton Plain is a majestic place. Uh, you probably know that I used to be a journalist during long time back, uh, and uh, uh, I did a cover story on Horton Plain uh, the, the, to the most famous Science Weekly at that time. Uh, the Horton Plain was experiencing what is known as forest dieback phenomenon at yes. that time. I remember I named the sort of theme of the cover story as uh, uh, the, 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 the treasure of uh, that part of the country is suffering from a heart attack. Uh, uh, the Azro named that place as the heart of that nation. Uh, it's, it's such a beautiful place. Uh, sorry, yes, I yes. disturbed you. Uh, the no, I mean, so, yes. so Anjana was yes. basically staying in uh, a heaven-like place uh, to do this research uh, despite lack of resources. It's uh, one of the most majestic places in the world, I would think. Yes, exactly. I mean, like the, the whole area, uh, about like 300, 400 years, were fully, uh, was fully covered with primary forest, but unfortunately with tea cultivation and so on, now the, some of the areas were cleared. 
and then uh, then still with that still at the moment there's a huge uh, um, uh, diversity um, um, of uh, biota exists there so um, we were so um, curious about what is happening um, uh, what, uh, in uh, uh, at the same time in the scientific world so we really uh, with the support of uh, mr rohan petiagoda we actually continued uh, uh, various biodiversity expeditions during that one year so uh, we were able to um, um, discover uh, about 10 new species of fish and um, we published all of them and mm -hmm. then um, um, how old were you two at that time uh we were around 27 years right right yes so uh so then uh, so during the, that here, here there was two young doctors uh, in uh, absolutely marvelous majestic wilderness uh, i know this area very well uh, <laughs> almost every tree and bush uh, they, they didn't uh, discover any species though i must have seen them not knowing what they were and uh, you two were basically discovering new fish species to the world uh, and you two basically recognized 10 new species of fish uh, being two young doctors waiting to get your internship appointment a uh, few months later yes yes so then uh, but uh, the most important thing actually happened to us was that uh, the intellectual discussions we had uh, during that time with uh, mr rohan petigar so at that time we were like you know not aware of or not exposed to publishing in science, publishing scientific research but i remember uh, in our lab uh, there there um, uh, regularly we got uh, nature science and all the uh, pnas all leading journals and mr petigar made sure that we read them mm -hmm. um, hard and copies then, so electronic copies at that time um, hard copies so he mm -hmm. used to read them and then he even put notes inside those uh, Uh, journals uh, to see read this paper read this part so it it was so uh, kind of thro thought provocative um, we had some very nice discussions and uh, and then but at that time uh, we so he was a fabulous mentor basically despite you two were young two doctors uh, him being a biologist still you two he was feeding your curiosity and raising the bar up by showing sort of world class journals and uh, how you yes. He is, he is he is still a person that we uh, look up to uh, even like at, at at this stage of career so mm -hmm. he actually um uh, what it actually broaden our scope because uh, in usual in routine medical training of ours we are sometimes one of my criticism is, is that we are kind of like getting uh, gradually used to a kind of a tunnel vision but um, this environment uh, made us to think that you know how to work with larger groups and uh, and then um, and with different opinions and then um, and then uh, especially like uh, respect each other's opinions when it comes to like you know explaining certain things and so on so uh, during that one year basically we were kind of almost on our own we were actually brainwashed like uh, just Uh, thinking of okay now we are uh, from here on out we will be um, looking for a scientific career uh, mm -hmm. so then uh, we did the internship uh, so then after that uh, luckily i got um, opportunity in rajarata medical faculty rajarata medical faculty was started in 2006 mm -hmm. so i soon joined uh, soon after finishing my um, internship i joined rajarata so then when i came and the Rajarata, ideal ideal department for you would have been parasitology obviously so that you could uh... Uh, study yes. large animals uh, in in depth exactly so it's the only relevant department for me so right right i was thinking okay then um, parasitology would be the only relevant department and uh, so then and at Kalana, that time kalan what did he do he is in uh, he joined biochemistry department of peradin mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, so we both join as um, probation lecturers and in rajarata uh, my department head was professor sarath tedri singha who was a um, very leading medical education figure in sri lanka and, uh, and a fantastic human being also yes of course so then um, actually uh, here in rajarata it was a very fresh faculty um, uh, so they uh, my uh, uh, mentors here in the faculty was uh, professor tedri singha and professor velgama both are from peradini so they actually helped me to um, Uh, develop my own niche of uh, work uh, rather mm -hmm. than pushing me to uh, different fields so they said okay you are happy uh, so you are excited about a snake bite and here andradhapura is a you know 
uh, place with uh, lots of snake bite patients. So you can carry on the same path and uh, so they help. So, so te te tell our viewers uh, the, uh, Anjana, the history of Anuradhapura a little bit. You are talking about uh, first ancient uh, kingdom of Sri Lanka. How many years of history uh, behind this uh, great city? Yes, I think um, uh, the, I, uh, I guess like at the, the current um, uh, ancient city that we are uh, seeing, uh, I think it's about um, 2000, uh, uh, nearly 400, 500, uh, nearly 2400 years old, I guess, like fourth uh, century BC um, structures are still uh, could be seen in Anuradhapura, the large tanks and so on, and then uh, various Buddhist monuments. Uh, since then, about uh, uh, until about 10th century AD, they lasted in Anuradhapura. So this is probably uh, uh, as a city, um, as a capital, it survived, survived more than, I guess, um, over a thousand years. So it's- And a, the, it is correct to say that uh, this is where the world first hospital uh, yes. located uh, in Mihintale and uh, there is archeological evidence that people can even witness today that there was some sort of a sub-specialization happened in medicine and they kept uh, patients as inpatients and there were surgeries performed and there were some folks uh, who were specifically good at uh, joint related ailments uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's rich history behind this city. So Exactly. Uh, I guess the, the concept of getting all the patients to one place and treating them at one place, I guess, this concept originated in this land, I guess. Um, in the entire previous... human civilization. Yes. So uh, then in Anuradhapura, I think uh, this area, some people, uh, especially snake bite researchers, uh, uh, call this place as snake bite capital in the world because so much snake or so much of snake bite. Uh, and also, if you look at the snake bite uh, literature, uh, the a large amount of publication has originated from this area because of thanks to um, great people, uh, physicians who worked in these areas uh, over the last uh, about 50 years, uh, continuously publishing. So there's um, lots of information as well uh, when it comes to uh, in medical literature. So then, um, uh, then uh, because the, 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 the ideal situation in the uh, area uh, and the uniqueness of the medical faculty and uh, all that, I, with everything, so I, it inspired me to uh, think of a, um, uh, continuing a career of, uh, uh, along the snake bites and uh, and try to um, uh, fill various knowledge gaps. So uh, because I am not a clinician or I'm not a clinical neurologist, so uh, I my basic idea was to um, use clinical studies as a researcher as well as uh, use um, basic science research and combine them to uh, provide answers for clinical questions. Basically, so, you are trying to unravel underlying disease mechanisms uh, of various clinical problems uh, that uh, your clinical colleagues face, uh, exactly. which is, which is uh, very timely. The, I just interviewed uh, Professor Alan Thompson, the current editor-in-chief uh, and uh, uh, the, one of the chair neurologists uh, and uh, the university executives uh, at UCL London. And my first question to him, uh, the video would be available eventually at WFN YouTube site, uh, was I was quoting a master's thesis paragraph from late uh, Ian MacDonald, again from uh, Dunedin, in New Zealand, uh, that he write uh, in 1957 exactly to this point, uh, that what we learn at uh, school, uh, the, the being inquisitive and uh, trying to find uh, underlying disease mechanisms uh, is at the heart uh, of good patient care. Because when you do know uh, why certain th things are happening in a particular way, is then helping you to understand uh, how you fix it. Uh, it is, uh, the irony of this is uh, obviously 1957, there was absolutely zero treatment for multiple sclerosis. Uh, but 2021, a guy like me in collaboration with the rest of the others uh, leading a global campaign uh, Basically, as you can see behind me, we want to stop multiple sclerosis. In other words, we want to cure it. 
we we can almost uh, put a full stop to multiple sclerosis because we have uh, exceptional understanding now compared to uh, sometimes back uh, when late uh, Ian McDonald and Professor Sumner and others were basically working with those cat experiments. Uh, so this is a case in point for youngsters to watch. That's why I disturb you and uh, the, the drew this the this connection back. So uh, let's go back to where you were. So keep, carry on. Yeah. So. Uh... Uh, exactly. So I think this um, this um, understanding of pathophysiology of disease process is quite important. Um, uh, and without that, I guess um, most of the clinical problems cannot be solved. So this, uh, unfortunately, snake bite um, is a disease of poor, disease of uh, underprivileged. This is of uh, uh, agricultural communities. So this is um, not a rich man's disease. So a uh, lot of, I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, investment in scientific research um, uh, on snake envenoming, understanding pathophysiology has been quite poor over the last um, uh, um, century or so. Uh, especially the treatment, the antivenom that we are using, it was initially developed in uh, late 1890s, uh, early 1890s actually, and then the 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 the, the, uh, the production procedures have uh, developed, but the fundamentals behind developing antivenom has been the same. So the, all, and then uh, what happened was uh, over the last hundred years. Gradually, when people start observing that when people get bitten by snakes, the clinical syndromes that they develop do not really respond to antivenom, then uh, uh, easily the trend was to blame the antivenom rather than trying to understand what exactly happens in snake when a snake bite pathophysiologically and whether antivenom can do anything um, if you understand the pathophysiology. So uh, luckily in 2012, I met um, Professor Jeffrey Bister from University of Newcastle in Australia, who is a leading figure, um, one of the leading figures uh, in this field, um, uh, debunking myths related to um, snake bites and understanding the pathophysiology. He was one of the foremost figures. So um, then- where, where, uh, where did you meet him? Did he came to Sri Lanka or did you meet him at an international meeting? I, I met him in one of the conferences in Sri Lanka, again, through my friend, uh, Karana Madhogi. At mm -hmm. that time, he has started a PhD with um, uh, Professor Jeff Fischbister. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we met in Sri Lanka and then after that, we had some discussion and then uh, Professor Isbister um, gave me a chance to visit his lab in Newcastle for two months in uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. So that actually um, then... Um, uh, that Would have been an eye-opener for you at that time. Exactly. So because I'm a medical person with some uh, background in zoology, but here now I'm exposed to a, a laboratory, biochemistry, uh, uh, laboratory with biochemistry facilities as well as uh, certain basic pharmacological work and clinical laboratory setting. So um, completely like I had to be like kind of um, uh, uh, um, again, uh, remodeled myself into a laboratory scientist because that was not quite what I was used to be. Um, so after that, uh, with the help of um, um, Professor Isbister, I started certain um, laboratory uh, tests uh, like ELISA tests um, um, and development of polyclonal uh, rabbit antibodies in Sri Lanka back in Rajarata. I learned those techniques and then wanted to uh, develop um, diagnostics of, uh, for um, uh, snake and venom. Mm -hmm. And then after that in 2014, I got a full scholarship from Monash University uh, for my PhD. Um, again, uh, supervised by Professor Jeff Fischbista as well as uh, Professor Wayne Hodgson from Monash Venom Group. Um, he's the he's currently the deputy in education in the Faculty of Medicine. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Professor Wayne Hodgson and his lab is uh, known as one of the foremost uh, pharmacology laboratories when it comes to um, toxinology in the world. Mm -hmm. So then uh, the next three years I spent in Monash uh, learning. Um, uh, pharmacology and biochemistry techniques related to iso like isolation of toxins from venoms and then how to characterize them pharmacologically in laboratory setup. 
at the same time my supervisors uh, were so good that uh, they sent me to various places to learn various techniques uh, i spent quite a lot of time in uh, university of queensland uh, learning uh, electrophysiological techniques like um, two um, uh, electrode voltage clamping cellular electrophysiology techniques so yeah. then um, using all these techniques i um, i uh, tried to understand how the uh, uh, neuromuscular paralysis occurs in snake and venom and probably why uh, this uh, why the antivenoms probably don't work and uh, at the same time i must mention one name uh, professor mike segwick from southampton um, uh, he uh, was uh, instrumental instrument uh, in, um, in uh, pushing me towards understanding single fiber electro uh, uh, myography, uh, a technique that I learned uh, to investigate neuromuscular dysfunction in snake and venom patients. So those clinical studies uh, that I- so You were basically that, looking at uh, the jitter and uh, the various changes that you'd see in single fiber BMG studies. Exactly. So uh, in snake and venom studies, unfortunately, all what we had at the uh, outcome measure was clinically developing uh, ptosis or ophthalmopegia, rather yeah. than that there was no other tool of measuring um, the exact point of where the patient develops uh, or start to develop paralysis. So with single fiber EMG, then I was able to see or uh, detect uh, neuromuscular dysfunction at subclinical level. And then uh, to understand um, uh, how long the paralysis lasts, even though the clinically, the patient, uh, patient's clinical status was fully resolved, still how long the paralysis lasts and so on. So uh, with, with the laboratory work that we did in uh, uh, Australia, we combined the clinical work in Sri Lanka and then the, 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 the parts of the puzzle nicely um, matched and then we understood that most of the snake and venom um, in, uh, in this part of the world, it is the presynaptic neurotoxicity that causes paralysis in humans, uh, which leads to destruction of the motor nerve terminal uh, uh, by the venom toxins and the patient so was it was it you know, very similar to what uh, the professor nimal senanayaka's group and rest of the others follow on uh, found out uh, as in the case of uh, intermediate syndrome uh, or a bit bit different uh, i think this is uh, i think this is I, bit, you had bit like 50, 50 to 100 single five bmg data when i chatted to you last time uh, i think that was before you were doing the phd uh, yeah so we had about i guess uh, with uh, about like 200 patients, I guess we did finally like of uh, single five BMG. Mm -hmm. And we found, what we found was but combining the data with um, the, the, the- Cellular uh, labor electrophysiology. Yes, uh, laboratory data. Uh, what we found was that most snake uh, venoms, uh, most snakes that cause neurotoxicity in humans, uh, they have presynaptic neurotoxins that actually damage the motor nerve terminal. Mm -hmm. uh, which lead to a structural destruction of the motor nerve terminal. And then uh, for after that process has, in, has been initiated, there's no way uh, large antivenom molecules to come and reverse the process. So mm -hmm. this process, um, once it is started, it's uh, irreversible. And uh, within three to five days, the uh, uh, motor nerve terminal start regenerating on its own, uh, repairing on its own. And until that time, uh, what we need to do is if the patient is developing um, life-threatening paralysis, make, uh, keep the patient alive uh, by mechanical ventilation, and then the, gradually the, uh, the paralysis would resolve. Um, but um, again, again uh, very much similar to organophosphorus insecticide poisoning and uh, intermediate syndrome and uh, respiratory failure, isn't it? Uh, exactly, exactly. And then uh, at that time, there was another uh, uh, understanding that uh, post-synaptic neurotoxins, that there are toxins in snake venoms that mm. affect uh, um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And uh, then uh, there was this school of thought that these toxins cause paralysis as well in humans. But uh, one of the major findings in my PhD study was that uh, uh, we realized that uh, the human nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is resistant for most of the snake, uh, 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 at least a larger group of snake post synaptic neurotoxins evolutionarily. And mm -hmm. uh, this is quite similar to the story of mongoose or hedgehog, 
where you know there's this fight between cobra and mongoose and most of the time the um, the mongoose survives or wins uh, and then kill the cobra and eat uh, this is mainly because the mongoose uh, nicotinica serialcholin receptor does not allow snake toxins to bind so there are certain mutations that had occurred uh, so we were able to simulate those mutations in human uh, receptor as well and then, uh, so basically we explained that uh, post and toxins are not that clinically relevant for humans. So that was basically my uh, PhD. So you were so, basically having whole heaps of fun completing your PhD despite the hard work. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. It was so, so rewarding, so rewarding. And, uh, and then after that, uh, uh, I was so lucky uh, because, uh, to have these mentors uh, because I, uh, after finishing my PhD, I came back to Anuradhapura and then in Anuradhapura, my university facilitated me in developing a laboratory to continue what I did in uh, Monash at the same time for funding. Uh, I mean, it's not easy for us to do, get funding very quickly um, for basic science research in Sri Lanka. So my um, supervisor, Jeffrey Smith from Newcastle, he uh, had NHMRC grants um, he's have, still having. So he funded me basically over the next few years uh, um, um, for my work. And then mm -hmm. I uh, got, um, I established connections, um, um, all connections with uh, re-establish all connections with uh, Monash. And then um, I got this adjunct uh, senior research fellowship from Monash. I'm still having it. So under that uh, collaboration, um, uh, I start supervising some of Monash students as well as my uh, students in my lab here are being co-supervised by uh, my Australian mentors. So that it uh, both parties, uh, um, uh, it benefits for both parties, but especially uh, people like us in uh, this situation, I think it's a great help. Uh, and for my students as well, uh, being able to work with these um, uh, leading researchers. I think there are three points that I want to take out of what you just said. Uh, uh, I, I, I heard the same thing from very senior, established and retired uh, game changers uh, in neuroscience uh, also. When you follow your nose, uh, when you follow your passion, when you do things that you really passionate and like to do, you don't feel tired uh, and you don't feel exhausted. Uh, the, you get uh, invigorated and you get enormous amount of energy and then you could give more. And the second thing is uh, making the correct connections and making having appropriate mentors and maintaining those relationships are beneficial for both parties. Uh, this is a common theme that I'm hearing from success stories uh, globally. I think uh, what we want uh, youngsters to take uh, by watching this uh, is just that, uh, the, the follow your passion, uh, the establish uh, good connections, uh, find good mentors, uh, be good mentees, uh, and make sure the relationship uh, is worthwhile for both parties, uh, then it is uh, long lasting. Just like uh, simple marriage, isn't it? Uh, we both know that the romance that uh, bring us together as husband and wife uh, or partners uh, doesn't last too long. Uh, yes. the, the, it, it's, it's all a team game and mutual benefits uh, for both parties uh, that uh, survive the marriage and the, make it a useful relationship for the world, uh, including child, children and rest of the others. So finally, Anjana, the, I know that uh, you don't probably get to see multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, last time when I checked uh, your country or Sri Lanka, uh, where I was also born and raised, uh, the uh, currently have about uh, 2000 patients uh, with multiple sclerosis. Uh, it looks like uh, Every month, uh, there are eight new patients being diagnosed as multiple sclerosis. Uh, the problem with multiple sclerosis uh, is although it is categorized as a rare disorder, uh, we still have uh, 2.8 million people with multiple sclerosis at this point of time globally. While science has progressed so well to the extent that we could almost stop multiple sclerosis or cure multiple sclerosis, there are, pro there are problems also. 70% of the world uh, including many Sri Lankan patients, uh, can't get uh, access to early diagnosis, can't get access to high quality treatment uh, in a timely and most uh, efficient uh, manner. That was the reason that uh, we introduced this concept of World Brain Day, which was in the making well over uh, 10 years, uh, but uh, was uh, uh, 
on paper since 2014, what we normally do is uh, we select a particular disease for that year. And the, the, day, the, the, brain, the day of the brain is the birthday of World Federation Neurology, which is the largest uh, neurology organization globally uh, connected to WHO also. And then we partner with uh, another international organization and then we use uh, energy and resources that we have uh, to advocate for that, that particular disease and brain health. Uh, you and me, we both are facing the current uh, calamity of this pandemic. Uh, you and me both seen exceptionally good aspects of human beings, uh, as well as exceptionally bad aspect of human beings coming out of this pandemic uh, across the board from politicians, academics, uh, uh, uneducated people across the board. So it just remind us uh, how important uh, for us to be interested in brain health, uh, brain matters. Uh, you were doing all those fantastic work, including discovering fish because of your brain. You were uh, tapping uh, the Dr. Rohan Petiagoda's uh, brain and uh, all the uh, mentoring that is flowing to you and Kalana because of his brain. So it, it just goes without saying that uh, how critically important brain function and brain health is. So as a, uh, the, as a sort of a rising star in your own field uh, and, a, and a, uh, becoming a senior academic and a global leader on your own in your own field, how excited you are to see, despite the pandemic and all the problems that this world is facing at this point of time, WFN and Multiple Sclerosis International Federation, MSIF, uh, partnering with this ambitious agenda to have uh, massive uh, global awareness campaign throughout the year. Uh, would you like to share your excitement with us? Exactly. So um, I think even before um, um, uh, this, uh, I think about like several months back, I, I, I started seeing uh, various social media posts re related to this. And then only I was like curious um, of, uh, uh, understanding what is this and uh, what what the role of um, world federation of neurology so um, um, i was and especially like with this pandemic we actually redefined our ways of communication and ways of uh, uh, um, uh, ways of um, uh, distributing the knowledge among the uh, public but Despite all these um, uh, obstacles, uh, what I understood is that still there are new channels being opened. So um, uh, raising awareness, maybe um, during this pandemic, we are we may not be able to take the conventional path in uh, in um, in raising awareness. But World Federation of Neurology has done tremendous work in uh, in um, you know through whatever the available media. For this work, and then I I I, I realized I just when I um, um, just saw your website and uh, how uh, the I mean the the knowledge the resources um, educational resources avail the availability of educational resources not only for general public but for even health professionals uh, it was just amazing and um, is and using um, uh, uh, media like YouTube um, uh, it was. Uh, Fantastic, and I'm, I'm, I think it's quite ex, um, exemplary uh, for other um, awareness campaigns as well. How this, you know, during this difficult period, this uh, World Federation of Neurology um, is uh, using um, whatever the available resources to um, uh, to end, uh, to um, to increase the awareness on multiple sclerosis. So I, I, I wish all the best, and uh, and I think um, we um, we uh, it, it actually gives. Uh, uh, good, uh, you know, new ideas for us as well. Um, how we can adopt same kind of strategies for other uh, other um, illnesses that we need to raise awareness on as well. Um, so it, I'm, I'm quite in, uh, interested and excited to see um, your activities in um, the next couple of weeks as well, um, along with this line. Uh, absolutely, Anjana. The, we we normally create uh, a thing called World Brain Day Toolbox. Uh, Usually, the prior to our birthday, which is 22nd of July, uh, the, the where World Federation Neurology was born, the, most of these massive organizations uh, usually were born out of coffee or some drinks uh, among like-minded people who wanted to build something. 
the the it's it's quite extraordinary when you talk to some of those people who are still alive uh, even today uh, at their yester years uh, how they were doing things uh, although they are massive global organizations uh, now the 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 toolbox basically we create a whole lot of uh, uh, press releases uh, the social media posts uh, images uh, to cover the world population and we also uh, embed the basic slide deck uh, that anyone can use uh, to raise awareness uh, in their city hospital village uh, temple school church uh, uh, the mosque uh, whatever so the idea is uh, our agenda is uh, at this point of time uh, the world global community one out of three of us whether we like it or not uh, are suffering from some sort of a brain disorder at least in a preliminary stage at this stage of time we have uh, means to prevent them 90% of the time with right toolbox uh, and most uh, uh, ailments uh, we have developed uh, therapeutics uh, also there are issues with access and other things uh, we have realized the importance of advocacy working with politicians working with policy makers working with academics uh, working with hospital leaders to bring them all to the common front uh, because eventually they all wanted to achieve the same thing even the most rogue politician anywhere in the world they still want their community to be alive and well uh, and as healthy as possible i think our job is to somehow put all these things together that's why advocacy is uh, such an important uh, issue uh, in fact uh, well, i got some good news for you also we have a couple of journals uh, which are reasonably popular in uh, the index uh, system uh, and we will have uh, a dedicated tropical neurology section uh, which will be opening up very soon uh, there is no fee for publication of the papers uh, in this journal so make sure that you submit your work uh, and uh, the having seen that uh, special volume you know that i had uh, some of my pre love in tropical medicine i was mentored uh, by some of the global leaders in tropical neurology during my time back in sri lanka during my much younger days uh, so i might try and do some sort of a review on some of those things i might invite you to help me out uh, co-authoring uh, some of those things if if time permits for both parties uh, so that that should be happening in the coming months uh, also so i think uh, the your, your chat uh, is quite illuminating for youngsters uh, anywhere in the world if you are passionate if you have the will if you have the desire rest of the other things usually fall into place uh, the but uh, to hear it from your own voice uh, to hear it from the host mouth uh, uh, what is your final message to youngsters uh, including your own students uh, at uh, rajarat medical school as well as uh, other healthcare students whether they are physiotherapy students nursing students uh, uh, globally for both uh, younger generation and older generation what do you want to say to them yes so uh, uh, in brief i think um, the message that i have is uh, think big uh, think big um, i mean like when we do uh, when we get our trainings whatever the specialty or whatever the subject uh, uh, stream may be we get trained by um, uh, for various professions but then our scope gradually becomes narrowed uh, down i mean uh, maybe due to various um, reasons but we with time gradually we tend to focus only on um, uh, a certain uh, a narrow area but there's you know enormous capacity uh, for us uh, to think big and plan our um, future horizon. yes uh, or widen our horizon uh, um, so uh, i think the key thing would be to trust yourself and trust other people and then build networks the future is uh, towards i think uh, uh, collaboration among different professions so uh, about 20 years back what we understood uh, was probably like uh, completely a different scenario but now it seems uh, not within the field of medicine with a uh, med field of medicine with maybe other completely different fields like economics uh, uh, mathematics so engineering fields 
we have to establish collaborations and the uh, world is moving. So uh, we have to um, adapt according to that. Sometimes uh, people who are uh, stuck in, uh, you know, rural corners, probably like me, might think, you know, that, uh, you know, that they might set our um, work niche um, according to our, or the, or to suit whatever the place that I'm stuck in. But it's not like that. Now, um, there are various ways of communicating, um, start collaborating with other people. So uh, think big can increase your network. Uh, work not only with um, you know your local people, work with international people, and then only you will start seeing the bigger picture. Otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise it's very difficult uh, to think narrowly and survive in this uh, day and age. It's uh, the, 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 I, I agree 100%. Uh, in fact, uh, I teach my resident and trainees and PhD students uh, that uh, if you are super competitive, if you are a super competitor, your competition is collaboration. If you want to win competition, you, learn, you need to learn how to collaborate uh, effectively and how to build a network. Uh, and I absolutely agree that you have to trust yourself. You have to trust others. Uh, and keep collaborating and think, uh, think and dream big. Uh, it's a pleasure chatting to you, Anjana. We wish you all the very best. Uh, and we wish you and your family and your colleagues uh, to stay safe and well during the pandemic. Uh, and we very much are looking forward to visiting, it, visiting you all one day. It doesn't look like it is happening anytime soon, but uh, let's stay safe and well and do what we can virtually and through other means uh, in the interim. And human being is a smart uh, species. Uh, uh, I mean, the, you and me, we both see the evidence uh, of uh, great science. Uh, I personally didn't think that uh, I would be fully vaccinated by this point of time. I thought that uh, even with the most effective means, uh, it would minimum take a good few years for us to see a good vaccine, but we do know that uh, we have uh, exceptionally effective vaccines uh, available, not immediately for all of us. Uh, the, the no country is uh, enjoying that luxury yet, uh, but uh, the, I'm glad that after G7 summit, uh, global leaders have seen that this as a global problem and uh, the globe is coming together. Scientific community done that much earlier than that you and me both see, seen, uh, witnessed, uh, plethora of publications. Every journal editor that I was interviewing were telling me that last year was extremely hard. Their manuscript uh, rate gone up like 200, 300%. Uh, so they were, they were working extra hard and they were giving their reviewers extra hard time also. That is, uh, that is excellent news. That means uh, scientists, are not, scientists are de-stressing by working even harder and putting their thoughts into papers uh, and uh, so the, 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 the global leaders coming together and the wanting to vaccinate global population is a good thing. Uh, this is not a national problem. This is a global problem. This is not a time to fight among ourselves. Uh, there's only one enemy, that's the virus. Uh, there's only one enemy that's the post COVID-19 related various syndromes and neurological issues and so on. Those are the fights that we need to fight. Uh, they're not the fights between ourselves or our little craft group. So we can do those fights later. Let's beat this uh, common enemy. But I'm optimistic. I think human being is smart. Uh, I think uh, we would see a much better, more even more collaborative world uh, than what we have seen before. Everyone thought that our World Brain Day campaign probably will not be successful last year. Uh, I have been chairing this for some time uh, and uh, normally I get to visit uh, five or six countries and organize activities with the help of other committee members. But last year I visited uh, almost like 80 countries virtually from my home. Uh, and I got to know uh, some amazing people who are doing great things from different parts of the world. This year, as you can see, I am working long hours and visiting various places, talking to various people. And I'm very optimistic that we would surpass 100 million mark uh, this time. Uh, so stay well and uh, all the very best. Uh, and uh, we look forward to reading uh, your and your group's uh, great work uh, as uh, they will they will help us to understand other things also. And you know, when you work on snake uh, venom and antitoxin things, uh, that might give us uh, clues uh, how we should unentangle 
autoimmune disorders, if you like. Uh, that might give clues uh, why COVID-19 virus is uh, causing so much havoc uh, in uh, neuropsychoimmunological pathways. Uh, so the, the, in this uh, war, we are all in this together. Uh, even though we may not be working together in the same lab, what one group does uh, influence the, how the other group uh, sorting out their piece of the puzzle. That's the beauty of uh, great science, isn't it? Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Tisa, for giving me this opportunity to have this lovely chat with you. And as you said, uh, yes, uh, over the last uh, probably like one, one year or one and a half years or so, uh, world changed and we somehow managed to change ourselves as well. And, uh, and I think we, have, we are still surviving and hopefully we will survive. Uh, uh, we will survive uh, in this environment. Absolutely. We, the, our ancestors survived uh, much nasty parasites and viruses. Uh, and uh, the, the only evolutionary disadvantage is if we start uh, infighting and we, if we start giving uh, unnecessary opportunity to this virus to mutate much faster than what we can handle. I think uh, you and me as uh, uh, educated people, uh, our job is to make sure that every opportunity that we get, uh, we talk to the common man and common woman uh, in the language that they can understand, uh, obviously with ample amount of kindness, compassion, and collegiality to educate them and educate them and educate them. Again, coming back to the brain health, you need to get good brains uh, all over this world uh, for us to survive this. But I am optimistic. Uh, I am super optimistic. Uh, yes, it is tough at this point of time. It is hard to not to have a cup of coffee in a cafe every now and then, the, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, uh, I think just like our ancestors did uh, for those thousands of years, uh, I think our generation would uh, face this uh, and hopefully our children can take uh, rest of the other things uh, even further. We'll keep uh, inspiring young people to do the correct thing. All the very best, Anjana. Take care and stay well and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, take care and stay safe.